Well, it is a pleasure once again to be with you and uh, to be still in the Gospel according to St. Mark. It's one of my favorite Gospels, not just because he's my namesake, uh, but also because in um, 2012, I had a, a good friend of mine, Patrick Menser, take me through a really in-depth study of Mark, uh, and it opened the scriptures in a way to me that they had never been opened before. And so it is a delight to share with you what he shared with me. You know, last week I talked about the fact that in this section of Mark's Gospel, he's looking at the 23rd Psalm and walking through each section of that Psalm and showing the identity and character of Christ, of our Lord and Savior Jesus, and how he revisits Psalm 23. And we're still there. This week, uh, we're dwelling on the passage that links with my cup overfloweth. And, and we're looking at not just in light of the psalm, but as always with Scripture, with everything that has gone before it. So there are a couple of key things that I, w I want to highlight in the text before we talk about them. Um, and, and I'll just run through them quickly. First of all, the apostles, not yet given that charge, disciples at this point, they've just spent the time going out amongst the people and they've seen incredible things. They've seen ministry at its best with God's provision, with the joyfulness of people healed and demons cast out. And look at Jesus' first response to this. He says, come away by yourself to a desolate place and rest a while. If you watch carefully, Jesus' life is filled with rest and time with his Father. And we will be fools if we do not follow his example. So they go away in a boat. This isn't just, let's go into the next room. Jesus wants them to get away, all the way across the Sea of Galilee. But while they're going there, everyone chases them down. So the second thing I want to highlight to you is, when they get out and Jesus sees everyone, this is the heart of our God. In 34, it says, when he went ashore, he saw a great crowd, and he had compassion on them, because they were like sheep without a shepherd. Compassion, it, it's a, a word that means to suffer with, not just to do things for from afar, but to enter in and to suffer with. Come with passion, suffer, suffer with. And this is the heart of our God. When he sees us in our distress, in our need, he comes to us. He suffers with us for our sake. Third thing I want to highlight. When we get to 35, we get displayed the hardness of the heart of the disciples in this moment. It says... And when it grew late, the disciples came to him and said, this is a desolate place, and the hour is now late. Send them away to go into the surrounding countryside and villages and buy themselves something to eat. Now, at face value, this is a need seen, let's solve the problem, Jesus. But notice it's not the same sort of heart that Christ has where he has compassion and gives of himself to them. The disciples see the need and say, send them away, send them away. We, don't, we can't fix this problem. 
have them go away. If you've got your Bible open, it'll be an easy look, especially if you've got an ESV probably. If you jump to the beginning of chapter 8, we do this again. That's the feeding of the 4,000. In Mark's Gospel, he goes through this double cycle where he's showing the identity of Christ. And in the first pass, they don't get it. Their hearts are hard. And so nothing makes sense and they don't give the right answers, and they don't live with the character and quality of Christ in their interactions. And so Jesus takes them to the very beginning, and we do it all over again. And in that second cycle, we end at the high point of Peter's confession of the Christ. They get it. And Mark changes his account from there. Everything was a lead-up, and as soon as Peter says, you are the Christ, it's a race to the cross. And everything speeds up, and everything is laser-focused towards the compassion of Christ for us. In chapter 8, when we come to this moment, and there's people in the wilderness, just like the Israelites in Exodus, when Moses complains about their complaining and says, how am I to feed all these people? Instead of behaving like Moses, as they did in chapter 6, listen to their response this time. And this time Jesus begs the question. He says, I have compassion on the crowd because they have been with me now three days and have nothing to eat. And if I send them away hungry to their homes, they will faint on the way. And some of them have come from far away. And his disciples answered him, How can one feed these people with bread here in a desolate place? And he asked them, How many loaves do you have? Notice, <clears throat> the disciples the first time say, Send them away. And the second time says, How are we to do this? Tell us. We'll do it. How are we to do it? It's a different heart attitude. It's not a hard heart, which says, not my problem, am I my brother's keeper? It's a heart that says, as Mary told those filling the vats, do whatever he tells you, and obeys. Finally, the last thing I want to highlight is the number of loaves and fishes Numbers are great and often very confusing in Scripture. Throughout the whole Bible, God is very careful through his inspiration of the authors to put numbers that don't just inform what happened, but unpack the significance of what happened. Right? Five loaves, two fishes, make seven. Seven is the number of completeness, right? In the sixth day, there was evening and there was morning. But on the seventh day, there's no evening and morning. It's the eternal seventh day. It's the seventh day of God's reign and rule of God's compassion on the world. So here is what St. Mark has held before us. This is the character of our God. Our God wants to be with us. He wants to give us rest. He has compassion for us in our weakness and our struggles and our trials. And he comes to us. He is patient with us. This is the first of two cycles with the apostles with some of the authors of scriptures by the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, with those saints that we look to, the apostles which the church is built on along with the prophets. Such patience and direction. He doesn't just cast them off. Moses' response to God when he's so angry with the Israelites at the event of the golden calf where he's ready to burn everything to the ground. He tells Moses, they've sinned against me, I'm done with them. I will be done with them, we'll start again with you. 
and Moses demonstrates the character of God, which God himself has drawn out in the counter, and says, don't do this to your people. They'll speak of you in all the world that you brought your people out here to die. If need be, blot my name out of the book of life, but save your people. And and it's almost tangible in God's response. Well done. That's not necessary. I will take care of that. And we'll keep working with all of them. Just like the Israelites in the desert and just like the disciples here in the feeding, so too with us, he says, you have hard hearts, but I will address that. We saw in our Isaiah reading in uh, verse 18, it says, I have seen his ways, but I will heal him. I will lead him and restore comfort to him and his mourners, creating the fruit of their lips. Peace, peace to the far and to the near, says the Lord, and I will heal him. We all have our various struggles. I'm not exactly sure what yours was. Last week, for some reason, God wanted all of us to be mindful of the words of our lips, that our lips would show forth his praise in every interaction. For this week, I want to make sure we not forget our healing comes from Christ. And it's, it's a healing that it's an impatience to it. We talk about the now and not yet. Now we are saved. We have been saved and we will be saved. If there's some aspect of your character, like there are aspects of mine, that do not show forth Christ to the world, that is the point of Christ's compassion for us. That is the place where he has come in this time and in this day in July of 2024 where he is speaking to us and showing himself to us that we would be healed. And it's a healing just like Moses, just like the disciples, which is not bound to us only. It's not just for our sake, but is for the sake of others. In the ordination rite for a deacon, the deacon is charged with equipping the saints to care for the stranger, to embrace the poor and helpless, and to seek them out so that they may be relieved. Right now, Father Sean has, in this time, a focus and stirring towards evangelism. You're working through the conversation of evangelism and and sharing what God has done for us to those who are yet far off. And I, I urge you, I beg you, do not spend a day ignoring the point of healing lest you not receive the good gift right in front of you. Do not pass another day failing to see it is not just for you that you have been saved. You have been bought with a price. And just as Christ came into the world not to be served, but to serve, so as Jesus says in his high priestly prayer in John 17, he doesn't want us taken out of the world. He wants us left here for this time, for these days, that the world would know him just as when he came, the world knew his father. In all things, glory to Christ. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen.